Hi, everyone. This is Catherine Adams. And Elizabeth Wallace. And you're listening to Binary System Podcast number 93. And tonight, we are recapping Alice Isn't Dead, Part 2, Chapter 10, the season finale of Alice Isn't Dead for this season. And we are definitely going to spoil all the things. The title to this one was called Why Am I Alive? And we do actually find out why she's still alive. Because remember, she asked that in a previous episode when she found Bay and Creek's secret base, whatever, why did they just let her go? Why didn't they just kill her to keep the secret? And we get some answers on that one this week. But they are kind of vague sort of answers. It's interesting because last episode, she's attacked. You know, we hear a car crash and a scream. And next thing we hear the woman's voice talking to Keisha. So we know that she's not in a great place. And the woman is talking to her and saying, you know, before you die, I want you to understand why you're here. And I'm like, oh, great. Is the bad guy going to spell out their whole evil plan before they kill somebody? But that's not entirely what she was doing. Yeah, this was all part of psychological torture before the actual torture got started. She wanted Keisha to hurt knowing what this was all about, knowing some of the answers. And um, it's pretty messed up in places. Yeah, yeah. We jump back and forth between what's going on in the room and Keisha's memories of when she first met Alice and how they, you know, how they started dating, even though she said it wasn't dating, and how they kind of fell in love and, and then I got married. I love the fact that, that she met Alice, who basically turned out to be the love of her life, about two days after she decided that her first relationship was done, but she was okay with that because she just decided she was going to be single for a while. <laughs> and then, then meeting Alice and deciding, well, shit, that didn't work. <laughs> Which is kind of the way it always goes, honestly. When you're just like, that's it, I'm going to go and become a nun. And then somebody walks into your life, you're like, the lights and heavenly choirs from above. What? Like, what? Wait, no. But the woman, we go back to talking to the woman. Did we ever um, get a name for her in the uh, in the credits? Is she just the woman? She was the woman in the police car at one point, I think. The stalker, the thistle monster. I don't know. One moment. You know? We were listening to it on the YouTube feed, and they mention her name. It's Roberta Colindres, and nothing that calls her anything. And I don't know. I mean, calling her the woman feels kind of wrong, because that was also the character on that episode of Sherlock that I like so much. Oh, yes. The woman. Yeah, I know, right? Well, she's the evil creature, whatever. But, you know, Keisha calls her a monster at one point. She's like, hey, that's not fair. And Keisha's like, no, you're you guys, you and the Thistleman, you're not actually human. And the woman says, you know, well, okay, you're close, but that's still pretty judgy of you right there. But <laughs> she doesn't deny it, but she's talking about why do she and the Thistleman work together? And that's really not the question that Keisha should be asking. She talks a little bit about what the Thistlemen are and that the fact that they enjoy the taste of blood and they have no restrictions. It's not like a vampire thing. It's not even really like a serial killer thing. They seem more like a force of nature. So she manages to get Keisha to come to the realization the government has been helping the Thistleman to cover all this up, to make sure that no one asks any questions. So, And then she asks, why would those who have never tasted blood help us? And then Keisha says, who benefits from this? You're like, that's the question you need to be asking right now. But it just sort of leads to more questions. And she just can't understand what is Bay and Creek's shipping company? What is their role in all of this? And we very, very, very slowly through a lot of back and forth come to the realization that Bay and Creek is on the side of the Thistlemen as well. More to the point, there is no two sides to this war. Bay and Creek and the Thistlemen are pretending to be at war, and the government is helping. I, th- that was something that really got to me. All right, okay, is the government in this storyline aware that Bay and Creek and Thistle are not really at war, and they're helping to put on a pretense of war so that, you know, of course, as the woman says, there's a lot of messiness and a lot of freedom in war, and a lot of people like that sort of thing and you can get away with so much and you can accomplish a lot if there's a war going on. So is the government helping them so the government can get secret things done 
or are Bayon Creek and the Thistlemen playing each side off of each other against the government, convincing the government, ooh, there's this war that you've got to cover up what's happening. So I'm not sure that was all that clear. I Isn't it funny? Because I assumed the government knows everything and that it's the government has planned this whole fight between Bayon Creek and the Thistlemen. And in the meantime, they get all sorts of other things done. And the woman even says that, yeah, she's technically working with the Thistlemen, but really she's just having fun. So I don't know that people like the Thistlemen or the woman could have come up with this kind of plan or organization on their own. They're just taking advantage of it. They're just having a lot of fun with it. The government's running everything. That's how I understood it. Yeah, and she gets to see the realization in Keisha's eyes when Keisha realizes Bayon Creek didn't save her or avoid killing her they actually sent the woman to kill her knowing that you know after her knowing that she would get killed so they wouldn't have to so they wouldn't have to get their hands dirty and she would get to do something she enjoyed so nobody's ever been on Keisha's side at this point including possibly Alice. That's the thing that the woman really wanted to torture her with. The biggest psychological torture is there are a lot of people who do work for Bay and Creek Shipping Company who think that they are on the good side of a war because it'd be hard to have that many people in on the secret. So you have some people who really do think that they're fighting monsters and everything, but no one knows, not even the woman knows, is Alice one of the people who thinks she's fighting the good fight or has she been in on it all along? Right. And Unfortunately for the woman, Keisha doesn't react as badly as the woman thought that she would. Yeah. She still, she says at one point, yeah, I can see it in your eyes, but I wouldn't be where you are. Of course, if I was where you are, I would be able to escape, and then I'd kill you anyway. You die in all possible versions of this moment. (laughs) Very, very creepy. But shes I I felt like the woman was getting more and more pissed off because she was really trying to break Keisha. She was trying to terrify her, trying to demoralize her, trying to everything. And Keisha at one point is just like, I'm always afraid. This is kind of my default mode here. So she doesn't freak out. She doesn't lose it. And the woman finally decides, whatever, fine. I'm just going to get on with the fun bit. (laughs) This isn't going to feel good. (laughs) Just that (laughs) That, comment coming out of the dark. Oh, my God. (sighs) So, yeah. And at one point, Keisha even wants to know where Praxis falls in all this. And the woman's like, what do you know about Praxis? She's like... I don't know anything. I don't even know if there's anything to know. And the woman's like, this is the smartest thing you've probably said in this whole incident. Yeah, we don't get any more information on that. No, we just get Keisha a few more memories and then some silence. And then the woman starts in and we hear the sounds of a scuffle and some screams. I was really afraid we were going to be hearing bone cracks or because and this I didn't quite understand it. She tore people apart in the past. She tore people's throats out. Sounds here like she's trying to strangle Keisha, which was surprisingly anticlimactic. Yeah, surprisingly actually. bloodless, I guess it would be. But I guess we yeah. don't really know how much she carved off a Keisha before she started strangling. True, yeah. But then we hear pounding on the door, and she's like, just a minute, I'm finishing up in here, because only her co-workers really knew of this place, yeah. supposedly. And then the pounding on the door gets louder and suddenly the door gets blown aside and then you hear gunshots and something falls to the floor. And then you hear Keisha saying, Alice, you came back for me. And I'm just sitting here going, yay! (laughs) And a voice, she just says, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you come with me? And that's it. That's the end of the episode. End of the episode, end of the season. And that's a pretty good way to end it. You know, it's a cliffhanger, but not an unhappy cliffhanger. We don't always get those. So, yeah. So I guess we still have the third season to go. And we have to learn, well, we have to learn the origin of Bayon Creek and Thistle. I mean, we need to find that out. I want to find that out badly. Uh, We also have to find out what the heck's going on with Praxis. I mean, that's just been sort of a, is that a red herring? Is that just something that's been sort of floating around in the periphery for a while that doesn't actually mean anything could be also we have to figure out exactly what's going on with alice just because she swooped in there at the last minute and saved her she did say i was wrong i'm sorry will you come with me Uh, what are all the things she's apologizing for you know was she in on it how much has she been helping to cover this stuff up yep that's all we get for now and as a reminder they do have a patreon account to support the third season since podcast advertising is a bit spotty at best 
costs. So uh, if you want to go and throw them a little bit of money, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Right. So uh, I guess in other news, oh, I had a board game night the other night, and I need to have more oh, of those because those are fun. So we, we actually nice. played three, and one of them I'd played before, which is Stank Oil. Have you tried that one yet? You were telling me about that one. That sounded fun. Yeah, that was where it's a little bit like a variation on Cards Against Humanity, except one person picks a profession or an identity like babysitter or priest or grave robber and then everyone else gets a you know series of cards with nouns and you have to pick two of them and put them together into a product and then sell them to the person wow i thought i had a pretty good someone picked kindergartner as the profession and i decided to go with safety lace and i was just trying to come (laughs) up with this sort of it's lace it's on the hem of your shirt or your socks or your collar i don't know and if you fall over it springs out in the safety net that catches you and keeps you from getting hurt and at the last second and it occurred to me to add also works with dodgeball and everyone's like oh (laughs) nice good product placement the winner on that round went to someone who used farts in the answer i think so of course you know Eh, kindergartner sometimes yeah winning with farts is kind of easy if it's cards against humanity or apples to apples or whatever just throw farts in there the trick was to come up with the most off the wall stuff you could but the uh, the second game we played was a uh, code word which i probably could play endless uh, rounds of that one it's just a bunch of Ooh. random words laid in a grid and the person giving the codes is on the opposite side from the rest of the team and they have to do one word clues about which code word you need to pick and you can't pick the wrong one because you'll either give a point to the other side or you'll hit the assassin and just you'll be out that'll be end of the game so yeah that was i like that sort of thing but the third one we played was mysterium and i don't know if you've ever seen that one before or Mm -mm. or seen it is so everybody has you've got a series of people and places and items and you have to figure out who did the murder, where it was done, and what the weapon was. And you have one person who plays as the ghost, and they have to coordinate everything. And they their clues are in the shape of visions, which are these cards with these random scenes on them. And they put that down to tell you which one you're supposed to pick. But you, it's all subjective because you don't know if the person playing the ghost is like, look, it's red and this room here is really red. So this must be the location or, you know, this is a statue. So obviously the statue, the little, you know, hand, uh, handheld statue must have been what was used to bludgeon the person to death. So it's wow. and or I don't know. It's like, you know, did, didn't you guys notice that the only one that it was a night scene and the only location you could see at night was this one here? So it's uh, <laughs> Oh, it's it's really, really freaky sometimes. But the artwork, if you just go ahead and do a Google image search under Mysterium, because the people, the objects, the rooms, the visions, it's all gorgeously painted. So everything nice. is just these beautiful shades of red and black and a little bit of yellow and green and everything. And it's just just gorgeous. So definitely check that one out. Nice. I need to, I need to play some more board games. See, my thing is I've, I've sort of been poo-pooing board games lately and I came to a terrible realization that the last time I did a whole bunch of board games I don't know if the games themselves were really really boring or if I just was playing with people who maybe just weren't that fun I don't know (laughs) but I was just like board games blah I don't want to do that anymore but all the games you're describing sound really really fun so I'd like to try that sometime I think you do have to get a good group of people too to yeah, enjoy it. Right. So that definitely yeah. helps. Yeah, because the one time I have played, and it wasn't board games, but my friend Jordan used to do Cards Against Humanities Night, and he and his boyfriend have some of the greatest people to hang out with. And God, just hilarious. You don't even really need to have alcohol to make that fun. Yeah, I know, really I know. Just And you have to come up with things that are um, offensive. It's just it's, yes. it's a requirement. Yeah, and which is nice around Jordan's friends. That's... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> drink. Siren, every drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, is, is this the one that has to play it the entire way through? No, no, no. He just came pretty close by. That's fine. Now, when we stayed over at your place, I think we had one of those one morning at about six o'clock in the morning. And I was amazed. I was like, this is the guy Liz has been talking about. He starts it yep. when he leaves the hospital and he plays it down the entire street yep, at six in the morning that's on necessary. a Sunday. <laughs> yeah, there's nobody on the roads, dude. No. Anyway. But it's actually kind of on a related note. So, you know, I've been doing these little doodle drawings where I draw little teeny tiny 
tiny versions of tarot cards. I don't know why it's just a thing I'm doing. And most of the time I go to this site called learntarot.com and they just have really itemized lists of what these tarot cards mean. And so that's, you know, I just like go in there. Once I draw it, I'm just like, oh, what is this thing supposed to mean anyway? But I just found the other day, they have a directory of tarot cards, like all the different tarot cards oh. that you could actually like find out there. Wow. This is a massive, ma that he has it organized by subject. There are, and I'm not kidding you, I just clicked on cats. There's at least five different cat-based tarot card decks. I mean, it's amazing. Fair cards, Wiccan cards, and then I found one and I put it on Leland of Lost in Sci-Fi. I put it on his page. Not kidding, a Halloween-based tarot card deck, and the artwork is pretty cool. Oh, it's very neat. Wow. You know, and I'm loving yeah. the tiny tarot that you're drawing the, uh, I guess it's the doodle tarot that you're making, or? Yeah, the doodle deck, I think is what we were going to call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I really think that would be awesome if you got that one published. And there are places online that you could go to get your tarot cards published. That that would be that would I'll be have to look fun. into that. That would be that would be kind of fun, especially after I've only got twenty four more left. Really, what? you've gotten that yeah. far through the uh, deck? I oh know. man! Yeah, <laughs> I I gotta look up. I don't remember when this started. I want to say like almost a year ago. I think. Crazy. Well, have you have you done all the easy ones now, or do you? Is it all yes. like the really really hard ones are left? Yes. Oh. Yes. Well, I mean, there's ones like the what is it? The uh, Major Arcana, mm -hmm. Emperor, the and Devil, the, the Lovers, the Hero Fant. Yeah, I've done a few of those the easy ones but I mean there's a few more I want to say there's like a pentacles one that's got like six pentacles and like a half a dozen people on it and I'm like oh my god so yeah I'm into the hard <laughs> all in this like how big like twice the size of a penny I think or, or maybe yeah, a yeah. penny and a half I think all about down the to size, that size of the top knuckle on your thumb that's about how big I'm drawing <gasps> very them, so. impressive yes. that you can get all that expression in those little tiny faces with just a line <laughs> and two dots but we know that from stick people of course yeah that was you that's were just you were us. just practicing this entire time with the stick people to uh to sure. work your way up to this project sure but we'll put a link to that learn tarot directory in there because if there's a thing that you're into they've got a tarot deck for it it's kind of fascinating i think it's mandatory for a lot of artists almost like sculptors have to do a chess set and painters yes. have to do a tarot deck a lot more interesting than doing like a calendar but calendars are fun too calendars are very pretty so next week, we should hopefully have another episode of Welcome to Night Vale, and we'll recap that or anything else that happens to pop up in the Nerdosphere. Mm -hmm. So uh, one way or the other, we will talk to everybody in one week. Talk to y'all later.